of exos on the floor today. Good. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're here assembled at the Legislative Assembly Press Theater on the traditional territory of the Lekongan speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. Of course, since the pandemic began, here in British Columbia, people have been pulling together. We've all been working hard based on the guidance and direction from public health officers and Dr. Bonnie Henry and her team. And our collective efforts have seen us flatten the curve to the point where we're prepared to take the next steps as we restart our economy. After the May long weekend, which is upon us, we'll be introducing phase two of our uh, restart plan and lifting some restrictions in that restart plan to see businesses get back to work, people get back to work, and the province get back to what will be the new normal as we go forward. I want to reiterate this is not the flick of a switch. This is a gradual increase in activity, and we'll do that in a manner that will keep everyone safe and will also allow us to test and gauge as we go whether these measures are appropriate for the public safety that we all want to ensure is our highest priority. The plan will be gradual and it will be based on scientific recommendations from Dr. Henry and her team. And today's announcement is going to be a focus on an area that I know a lot of children have been waiting to hear about and a lot of parents as well. We're ready today to announce a gradual increase in returning students to classrooms. In-class teaching has been absent for the past two months and it's time now, starting on uh, June 1st, for students to have the option to return to school on a part-time basis. This step will pave the way for a cleaner and smoother reintroduction of full-time classes in September. And it's our genuine desire to make sure that no one feels pressured to do this. I understand if parents or children are anxious about going back to classrooms, and I want to assure you that we would not be making these announcements today if we felt there was an undue risk to the health and well-being of the youngsters that are going into our schools or, the, or the, the adults, the teachers and support staff that we so much depend on to care for our children throughout the day and give them the tools to be full participants in our society as they grow and then graduate from high school. These steps will pave the way, as I said, for a full start back in September. Many people will welcome this announcement today, and I know that uh, there are a number of young people that I uh, live in my neighborhood that are desperate to get back to real teachers rather than mom and dad or big sister and big brother. And this adjustment will take time, and the online program has been, I would argue, successful. Minister Fleming can give more details on that in a moment, but our objective here and our top priority is to make sure that schools are safe. Rigorous cleaning procedures are in place and all schools will be following the guidelines put in place by Dr. Henry and WorkSafe BC. And again, I want to just reiterate that this transition is voluntary, but I believe that it's going to be positive, net positive for the kids of British Columbia. It's going to be positive for teachers, positive for support uh, staff as well. This plan is based on science and safety standards and I'll let Mr. Fleming step to the podium and give you some of the details on the restart, which begins on June 1st. Good morning and thank you, uh, Premier Horgan, uh, for the introduction and for being here today. I'm grateful to be speaking to everyone uh, here on the territory of the Lekwungen, the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. Uh, the last two months have been a challenge for all of us. Uh, we've worked together as a province to flatten the curve. We understand how difficult this pandemic has been and continues to be on families right across British Columbia. For many parents and guardians, this has meant trying to juggle work obligations while taking care of kids at home. While precautions like physical distancing and remote learning have been necessary to keep everyone safe, it hasn't been easy. A lot of children are really missing uh, classroom time with their teachers and classmates. School's a place where kids learn how to connect with others. It's a place where they grow as people. And not having those places learn and grow has been especially hard for children who need extra support or for kids who find that school is their safe haven in their lives. Dr. Henry's steady leadership, along with the cooperation of everyone in British Columbia, has brought us to this point here today, to a place where we can take gradual steps and allow more students back to class in the safest way possible. As the Premier has said, this won't be back to the way that school life was before the pandemic. There will be strict health and safety standards in place. 
schools will look significantly different than before the pandemic. Our government has taken a cautious, measured approach. Students, educators and staff should feel confident knowing we're taking every precaution to put their health and safety first. I'd also like to uh, emphasize, as the Premier has, this return to class for students is optional and entirely voluntary. It is the parents' choice to send their children to school now that we are resuming partial in-class instruction. We have looked uh, at the Ministry of Education in collaboration with all of our K-12 stakeholders at what other jurisdictions have done uh, around the world, what is working, how they have managed the return of students to in-class learning. We have relied on the science and medical advice of the provincial health officer to guide our return to classes in a gradual and measured way with strict health and safety measures in place. From the start of this pandemic, we've worked closely with the 60 public school districts, with independent schools, First Nations, teachers, support staff, school leaders, parents, all of BC's education partners to make sure that whether you live in Surrey or Haida Gwaii or in Kamloops or Smithers, the same strict health and safety standards apply province-wide and they must be followed by everybody. We have today in BC already more than 5,000 students who have safely returned to school and are being accommodated there each and every day. These are the children of essential service workers and those who need extra support. As we get ready to take this next step, we now have new public health guidelines from the Provincial Health Officer and the BC Centre for Disease Control. These are for schools to operate safely under that will help ensure the safety of our students and education professionals. All boards of education and independent schools will be required to implement these measures and provide their operating plans to the Ministry of Education. To do things safely, we will need to limit the number of students in schools so we can manage physical distance and physical contact between students. We'll do this by having most students attend school part-time and by staggering lunch breaks, recess, drop-offs and pickups. Students from kindergarten to grade five will be in school half-time. This could be two or three days a week, but it means that elementary schools will be at 50% or less of their normal capacity on school days. For grade six to 12, 20% of students will be, get, will be in a school at any one time and no more. So for each middle and secondary student, that is likely one day per week for the month, in the month of June. Each Board of Education and Independent School are preparing detailed schedules and transportation plans to welcome students back. And for children of essential service workers, those who need extra support, they will continue to have access to school full time. We will continue to make those accommodations available so we can keep our front lines and essential uh, supply chains uh, working and support those families who are working on behalf of British Columbians. Districts will be reviewing their available spaces in schools. They will adjust things like hallway flows. They will look at reducing the number and sizes of groups of kids congregating in common areas. There will be regular rigorous cleaning schedule for high contact surfaces, things like doorknobs, washrooms, keyboards and desks at least twice a day, while school buildings will have a deep cleaning daily. Students, educators and staff will be required to clean their hands upon entering school property. There will be more hand sanitizing and cleaning stations available. And staff and students and parents must do a self-assessment daily for symptoms of COVID-19, influenza, the common cold. Any student or staff member with any symptoms, however mild, must stay home as that is the case in any workplace now right across British Columbia. Measures to ensure safe bus transportation will need to be implemented. Things like one student per seat, uh, unless children are from the same household, as well as plexiglass barriers to separate the bus driver. It's going to be very strict and it needs to be. We also need to remember that a lot of young people returning to school will have experienced stress and anxiety in their lives as a result of this pandemic. And it's important kids receive this type of support from their schools as well. I know teachers and support staff are there to support students' mental health and well-being, and their professional dedication to our kids is at the heart of our school system. As an, an additional mental wellness resource, we recently partnered with the WE organization to ensure students in grades K to 12 have access to a free virtual WE well-being program in both English and French. We've also expanded our ERASE program, Expect, Respect, and a Safe Education, at erase.gov.bc.ca with more mental health support for students and trauma-informed practices for teachers. ERASE has an online student safety reporting tool, so if any student is worried about something, 
they can anonymously let an adult know who can lend support. I also want to uh, announce and let parents know today that remote learning continues and, be, and uh, to be available for all students in British Columbia. Families that want to can continue having their children learn at home. And for those families who choose to return to school on a part-time basis on June 1st, remote learning continues for them when they are not in the classroom. Our Keep Learning website has been a great resource for parents and kids to learn remotely. Since the launch of this site at the end of March, hundreds of thousands of people are using this site. It is updated regularly with new device-free activities for kids of any age, and that's how we support families. Uh, it is one of the many resources that are available out there and will continue to be updated regularly. It's also a central place uh, for learning links to other sites internationally, as well as the BC curriculum uh, on subject matters that are for any school, uh, any kid of any age. Uh, it also additionally uh, includes mental health and wellness resources for kids to get help when they need it. That site, as I mentioned, will be available and updated continuously. As we get ready to take the next steps, school leaders will be contacting families to make arrangements for students to come back to class part-time on June 1st. Parents can expect to hear at a local level from uh, school-based uh, instruction uh, details before May 22nd. If you don't, we recommend that you contact your principal uh, after May 22nd if you haven't heard. We'll be asking parents to follow the schedule provided for your child so we can ensure everyone has a safe and orderly start. All of the work we're doing today will pave the way for a return to full-time classes planned for September, provided it is safe to do so. I am incredi incredibly grateful that here in BC we have an exceptional team of dedicated professionals supporting BC students during these very challenging times. And I'd like to thank everyone for your continued flexibility and patience as we work through this next step. The BC way has been the collaborative way, and I'm so proud that the Ministry of Education, the 60 school districts, independent schools, have worked with unions in education, have worked with administrators, the BC School Trustees Association, the Principals and Vice Principals Association, the BC Confederation of Parent Advisory Com uh, Councils. All of these essential partners have given valuable input into the safe plan that we have announced uh, and that we are going to put in place moving to stage three on June 1st. And with that, I would like to now introduce our Provincial Health Officer, Dr. Bonnie Henry. It's under her direction and guidance that we've been able to get to this point, and all British Columbians are fortunate for her leadership. Thank you very much, and good morning. Um, as Minister Fleming has said, COVID-19 has been a, cha a challenge, a huge challenge for all of us. And it's been felt by everybody, and perhaps no more so than by our children around the province. Suspending in-class learning was a necessary pause in March, and it is something um, that has meant for many weeks now, school has been very different for many families and all of our children. But learning, whether in the classroom, at home, or outside, has not stopped. And I think that's a very positive thing that we've seen. Parents and teachers have been doing their very best to support our children and provide ongoing learning opportunities. I know for many students, staff, and educators, being in the classroom is where they want to be. As we shift into phase two of the BC Restart Plan, getting back to school and reopening our childcare centres to everyone is at the top of the list. Ensuring that it is done safely, however, is my priority. Everyone in our education system, as well as everyone who needs childcare so they too can return to work, needs to have confidence that returning to classrooms will be done with safety top of mind. I have spoken extensively about the importance of keeping a safe physical distance, washing our hands regularly, not touching our face, increased and frequent cleaning and disinfecting, and very incredibly importantly, staying home if we're sick at all. And that is going to be incredibly important for all of us as we, moved into, as we move into this next phase. So whether you think it's allergies, a mild cold, the sniffles, that's the time you need to stay home, stay away from school, stay away from work, and stay away from others. The health and safety measures and the guidelines for childcare and for schools announced today include all of these important principles. The new approach and the measures we have in place are not forever, but they are for the foreseeable future and certainly for the month of June. And this is how we are going to um, build our confidence that we can do this together. 
They will allow teachers, teaching assistants, early childhood educators and children to be begin to confidently return back to the classroom. However, we will be monitoring this situation in schools and daycares very closely. If someone does become ill, we have a comprehensive plan to support them and to support the entire school community. This is something that all of us in public health take very seriously. I want you to know a thoughtful and measured approach is being taken. This is about moving forward in a way that we can all feel good about. Some uh, parents may choose to have their kids return on June 1st. Others will wait until September and that is absolutely fine. You have to do what's right for you and your situation and make those decisions for your family. And I do want to also say for the 2020 grads, the young people who are in grade 12, I mean, this is such an important transition year in your life. And I know um, I've said this before, you are truly unique. Graduating in the middle of a global pandemic is something that has not been seen for over 100 years. But the reopening of your schools in June is an opportunity to see your friends and your teachers again at a safe distance. It's an opportunity to say hello and potentially to say goodbye as you prepare to go into the next very important and exciting stage of your life. So I encourage you to take advantage of that and to know that it's done in a way that's safe. So teachers, teaching assistants, early childhood educators, staff, child care providers, young people in daycare and students from kindergarten to grade 12. Please know that we are standing together with you, supporting you to keep everybody safe. We will get through this by all of us doing our part. And of course, we will do this by being kind and being calm and staying safe. I now want to introduce Minister Chen and the Minister of State for Child Care. Thank you very much, Dr. Henry. And um, we all know as a parent, uh, whether if you're parents uh, from the K-12 system or your parents looking for childcare for under five or for school age care every day, and as a mother myself, we make decisions um, that we believe is the best for our children. And we'll have to continue to make those decisions as we recover from this pandemic. And there's gonna be a lot of decisions involved trying to do our best um, to decide what's right for our families. And childcare has really been an important part of that. As parents are gradually returned to work, we want to make sure that childcare services are available so parents can have the peace of mind when they're at work, knowing that their children are being looked after and cared for in a safe and healthy environment. And during this pandemic, there have been more than 2,600 childcare centers that have remained open and serving many essential services workers and their families. So those essential services workers can continue to do their very important work supporting our community at this very difficult time. And May is Child Care Month, so I want to take this opportunity to thank all the early childhood educators and providers for stepping up, serving those families and serving our community. And as we continue to move forward um, towards a recovery, many people will return to work and will need those very important childcare services. So we have been, and we've been very thankful to have the opportunity to work with Public Health and Dr. Henry's team to see how we can safely support those services. And today, again, thanks to Public Health, we are releasing new guidelines, updated guidelines to ensure childcare can continue as they have been to operate safely. And just like schools, childcare centers will need to take additional precautions to maintain health and safety, which could include hand wash your hands um, as frequently as possible, make sure we break up activities between children when they're indoor, and also encouraging more outdoor activities, especially when the summertime comes, we can do outdoor activities uh, in the uh, playground for the childcare centers, or even doing snack times at uh, the outdoor playground. But I also wanna emphasize this is very important that childcare is not mandated to reopen. It is really up to childcare providers to reopen or to return to their more regular capacity, depending on what is the best for their operation. And again, following the health and safety guidelines of our public health. And what our government is doing is to provide support, um, especially through our temporary emergency funding to ensure that we can support licensed centers to stay open, to cover for up to 75% of their operating cost. 
And we also want to support centers who are temporarily closed to help to pay for the fixed costs for their centers so they can come back and reopen when families need the services and the spot, and at the same time making sure families who are not using the spots don't have to pay for a fee for those spots that they're holding. And centers that are receiving temporary emergency funding will continue to prioritize spaces for frontline workers, parents who are working on the front lines of this COVID-19 response. And if it works for the center, additional spaces can then be offered to their regular families as the center and early childhood educators return, uh, decides to return to uh, more capacity. And to, until today, our government has invested more than $90 million in those emergency fundings to providers to maintain their centers, to support their early childhood educators and parents. And this funding will continue, uh, continues to be available and will be assessed on an ongoing basis as we gradually to see schools and business reopen in our province. And our goal, again, is to provide the support needed now as we begin, begin to recover from this pandemic and we've really achieved a lot during the past three years through our childhood PC plan, and we want to make sure the support is available so when we can recover and we can continue our plan to build an inclusive, quality, and affordable early learning care and system for all families in BC. We know this has been a really stressful time for both parents, early childhood educators, and providers, and we really thank you for your patience during this time. And to borrow a quote from Dr. Henry, Let's continue to be kind for each other as we proceed and go to the new normal. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Katrina, Dr. Henry, and, and Rob. Uh, again, I, I have full confidence in the team that you've just seen here who have been focused over the past two months in ensuring that as we begin the restart, of our economy that we focus on the most precious assets we as British Columbians have our children, whether they be in child care centres, whether they be in our K-12 system. Uh, Minister Fleming and Minister Chen have worked tirelessly with numerous stakeholders to make sure that we're talking to everyone, we're open and transparent about how we're going to proceed. And I'm very, very confident with the work that both these people have done, with the numerous people in the community that deliver these services that are so essential to how we grow as a, as a province and as a people. So uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions that uh, you may have. Reminder to reporters on the line, please press star one to get in the queue. Our first question today is from Richard Zisman. Uh, this is a question for whoever wants to answer it. There's obviously a lot of gaps that still need to be filled here. Will teachers be required to do both uh, virtual learning and in-class learning? Uh, how will that impact the students that are doing virtual learning if the answer is no? And will students have their own teachers and how will those determinations be made? Right. Yeah, no, thank you for the question there. That, that's one of the things that uh, the ministry and school districts, right down to individual schools, uh, are working on uh, right now. Uh, we have some very good templates, suggested schedules to arrive at the goal where we continue to support online learning for those schools who choose not to return uh, to the classroom uh, in June. And of course, those who are uh, in smaller divided classes uh, to reduce the density of children uh, and taking advantage of part-time in-class instruction. So there's a commitment there to, uh, to work at the local level in collaboration with local teachers' uh, unions uh, to, uh, to manage and accommodate that. We, we have to support all students. Uh, there are a lot of students uh, who will uh, significantly benefit by having a partial return to school that are struggling with the online learning environment and, and, and other kids that you know, regularly experience all kinds of things around summer learning loss as it is, that would be magnified uh, between March 30th when spring break happened if we, if we simply had no in-class learning opportunities before Labor Day. So it's, it, those services that I mentioned will continue online um, that can be used by all students uh, alongside the in-class uh, instruction that will be uh, made available on June 1st. Our next question is from Lisa Cordasco. Thank you. Uh, just to follow up then, if I understand this, there's no guarantee that these children will um, be reunited with their actual teachers. And, and what about teachers who are, let's say, 60 years of age or older in that higher risk group? Will they be forced 
to return to classrooms or will accommodations be made for them to do the online learning, for example? I think some of this, um, look, classes will uh, stay with their teacher uh, in, in every circumstance where that's possible. There will be some exceptions uh, due to um, health conditions and, uh, and those sorts of things. But uh, we have school-based teams that will uh, fill in uh, gaps should they arise. Uh, but we expect classes to be kept together, uh, kids to be learning together online, uh, kids to be uh, learning in smaller numbers, but still with their classmates uh, in class. Uh, we do have uh, you know, a team-based approach in our school system. We have specialist teachers. We have the benefit of uh, support staff, educational assistance, uh, and, uh, and principals and vice principals to engage in the intricacies of the scheduling. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we're giving districts uh, the ability to uh, work collaboratively on what those schedules look like. We don't have a one-size-fits-all uh, education system in normal times, uh, but I think we have uh, an agreement that we need some consistency and, and some best practices, but things look differently uh, in rural BC than they do in, in, in urban and suburban BC. So there might be some slight variations, but uh, the direction here is to return to part-time uh, K-5 to in-class instruction and uh, a significant uh, uh, you know, one day a week for uh, grades K to, uh, 6 to 12. Our next question is from Dirk Meisner. Well, hi, hi, Minister. Uh, thanks for doing this. I'm speaking with a close family member and observing this family member over the past while. It, this has been um, tough on, on kids and, and uh, glad you've acknowledged it. But uh, I've had a request. Are you um, at all considering some form of compensation or gift for kids for all the sacrifices that they've made over over this period? Uh, I, I think uh, all of our kids need to be commended for their resiliency. I, I appreciate what Dr. Henry has just said in particular about the class of 2020. This is something that will be unforgettable for the rest of their lives, um, you know, being the pandemic grad class of 2020. And uh, we'd like to recognize that around the usual graduation uh, ceremony time that is simply not possible because we'll continue to restrict and ban large gatherings in BC. But, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm very heartened by the creativity of, of districts in working with kids in, in acknowledging the resiliency and the tough times. And our ministry has put out resources that are been, have been very focused on the mental health and well-being uh, of students of all ages across BC and make it really simple for them uh, to connect to those kinds of things. We're in this together. That is our mantra as a province. Uh, and, uh, and all of us have a responsibility to make sure that really important community institutions like schools uh, have remained functioning as they have over, uh, over, over the last couple of months. To have, for example, um, 75,000 meals and counting delivered to vulnerable students uh, across British Columbia is incredible to have distributed uh, something like 25 to 30,000 devices for kids who, uh, who don't have those things in their home uh, and have a lending program for technology and iPads and those things has been up to the creativity, uh, down to the creativity of, of, of school districts to implement. So um, that's how we work with kids. That's how we support families and, uh, and we'll keep doing that. Next, we have a question from Maria Rantanen. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering, I understand that uh, for the younger students, so socialization has been something they've been missing out on, um, and they'll be getting a little bit of that. But I'm wondering with the upper level high school students who are preparing for post-secondary, how are you going to ensure that they're getting academically prepared consistently across the board, um, with many of them planning to go to university either this fall or next year? Yeah, no, thank you for that question around transition to post-secondary education. We made the assurance uh, way back on March 17th when we in initially announced the direction we were taking on suspending in-class instruction that kids weren't going to be penalized simply for, um, you know, being thrown into a pandemic. We were going to make sure that everybody on track to graduate uh, will graduate. Uh, we have worked with post-secondary education leaders to make sure that you know, allowances around uh, transcript is, is, is done without disruption and that there be a generous consideration for everybody that wishes to uh, complete school and move on to the next phase of their life. And, and that's the kind of collaboration and cooperation 
we've been seeing. Uh, teachers and support staff have been working incredibly hard. Uh, that has to be acknowledged in our school system. And some of those are specialist teachers like uh, guidance and career counselors who work with students. So, you know, they've had to work over the phone. They've had to work uh, remotely uh, using video conferencing uh, technology. Uh, but they've been keeping track of their students and uh, ensuring that the, they're getting the help that they need. I think it will be a benefit to uh, senior uh, secondary st school students to have that one day uh, return to class, to be able to, to, to have some face-to-face uh, -face time in, in very reduced numbers, of course, only 20% of the usual student body being in a building at, at one time, but to, to have that contact and to be able to complete their coursework and, uh, and, and finish their school year with a with this high degree of confidence uh, and to, to, you know, to know that everyone's doing their best and, and things are going to be okay. Our next question is from Justine Hunter. Oh, hi. Uh, thanks. And I'm going to try and jam in a double barrel question here. Uh, the last question was about uh, the consistency in academics and it's uh, with all this flexibility between the different districts. I'm worried, wondering if you're worried about uh, inequities between the districts and the, the kind of quality of education that kids are getting. But also, we've had teacher shortages in many areas going into this, and I'm wondering what it's going to look like if we're going to have increased teacher absences, uh, if every teacher is supposed to self-isolate if they've got a sniffle, which uh, I understand the reason for that, but how do you deal with the HR piece of that? Yeah, I think there's a variety of strategies. I mean, in a rural district, um, there's some schools that are so small they don't have a full-time principal. Uh, we're going to have to have district principals uh, provide those roles in, in, in large districts, large schools, um, and, in, and in working with the, the children of essential service workers. Uh, the TTOCs, the teachers on call, have been uh, incredible stepping up and working with those kids, and they'll uh, be available to uh, fill some of the gaps you suggest. Um, you know, might, might need filling uh, uh, going forward with the uh, partial return uh, to in-class instruction. And the second barrel of your question, you'll have to remind me. The inequities between districts. Ah, inequities between districts. Uh, we're releasing uh, a number of documents that, that bring a consistent, clear direction today around the new health and safety protocols, uh, what to expect. Um, I mentioned that we've, we've, we've been able in BC to get people working together because government has been very transparent, um, has worked with every organization to get their input, and we have some work to do around the scheduling in particular. So we want to have a collaborative approach uh, continuing over the next two and a half weeks because that's how much time we have between now and June 1st to, to get a schedule that makes sense uh, in a particular district, knowing that most of them will look virtually the same across the 60 districts but some of them may have local variations that make a lot of sense because we have elementary schools with as few as 10 kids and we have elementary schools that uh, have much larger student populations and they're going to have different planning exercises to reduce the density of kids to have a circulation in a building and, and all of the uh, health and safety protocol practices uh, implemented. Next we'll go to a question from Tanya Fletcher. Oh, hi there. Um, just wondering how closely you are following other provinces in making today's decision. Um, for instance, Quebec had to pull back on its plans to reopen schools. What other jurisdictions, other provinces or even countries have you looked at as a model for how to or how not to do things, especially if we anticipate a second wave in the fall? Yeah, of course we're following uh, Quebec because uh, outside of the uh, Greater Montreal area, they have resumed in-class instruction um, uh, this week. Um, there's a number of, uh, of Western European and Northern European countries that have had uh, classes uh, return uh, for up to a month. Uh, Denmark, I think, is one of the ones that's, that's most interesting and there's a lot of resources online to, that parents can look at uh, that gives them an idea of what the uh, quote-unquote new normal looks like in a, in a physically distant, safe uh, school environment and, uh, and how well kids and, and uh, teaching and support staff have responded to that. So I would say uh, Denmark has been very instructive. New Zealand, of course, we've been in close contact. Uh, my deputy minister has uh, uh, been in contact with his counterpart in, in that jurisdiction. Uh, we're looking at uh, some other Scandinavian countries as well. So um, through the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, there is an uh, international table that is uh, looking at uh, pandemic best practices in the school system. So there's a lot of things. Uh, that inform us. But the, the greatest influence, uh, quite frankly, on, on, on the discussion and what's got us to the point today is, is the leadership of Dr. Bonnie Henry, the provincial health 
office and uh, working with uh, the CDC, uh, WorkSafe British Columbia, and all the uh, employee groups and uh, partner organizations to have a made in BC approach. So we have, yes, uh, looked at and learned from other jurisdictions, but we've also uh, put into effect uh, some protocols that, uh, that are for the BC uh, situation that will work well to, uh, to keep people safe and, and, and get kids uh, back uh, in, in some reduced form, albeit uh, returning to in-class instruction. Our next question is from Lisa Yuzda. Minister is uh, sort of doing a double barrel as well. Um, what accommodations will be done for ECEs and teachers who don't feel safe coming back to work? And with that, will that make up for people are hearing about layoff notices? Will that make up for the teachers who may be laid off that they will be filling in? And also, will ECEs and teachers be tested regularly like frontline workers are? I think um, in terms of uh, the accommodations uh, for, of course, any teacher who's sick, they have to stay home uh, or uh, have another con uh, pre-existing health condition, um, it will follow the rest of the public service and, and even private sector employers in terms of um, making accommodations. The school system will make accommodations for uh, teachers and support staff um, who need them. Uh, and, and that's a commitment we've made in our discussions with uh, with unions that represent uh, uh, those staff in our in our school system. Uh, in terms of um, testing, te the testing regime is there for people who need tests that may involve uh, some uh, teachers and support staff if, if they... Yeah, I'll let Dr. Henry uh, speak to that. And uh, yeah. Just to say that uh, there, there's no value that we see in regularly testing people without symptoms, but absolutely we will be, as I said, monitoring very closely. And uh, it is a very high priority for any child or uh, family member or um, staff member in the schools or child care centers. If they have any symptoms at all or any concerns, then they are in the group that is prioritized for testing. And we will continue that and we'll continue to monitor. Really importantly will be um, that self-check that we need to do uh, every day to make sure that we're not feeling uh, the least bit unwell. And that's going to be really important, particularly in June, as we build up our confidence through here. And that will be uh, the, the process and the program that we'll be um, modifying and adapting as needed as we go into the fall. And in terms of early childhood educators, um, as I've mentioned, that it is really up to the provider or early childhood educator to decide when they can safely reopen or come back to their more regular capacity. Um, childcare sector is very diverse. There are so many different ways of operating a center. I've heard from, uh, for example, small family childcare provider who has a senior at home or a family member who may have some health uh, concerns, um, so they don't feel safe to reopen their center, and that is uh, up to their decision. They know their operation the best, and following public health um, officers' guideline, we know childcare can safely reopen. But there are so many different situations, so we definitely want to trust our early childhood educators and providers to decide what's the best for their center. And that is why our temporary emergency funding provides support to both centers who are open and also centers that are closed, so we can go through this recovery phase together with the support available and be able to come back and serve parents' childcare needs and and really our community and economy needs um, when the pandemic is over. Thank you. Our next question is from Alex McKean. Hi, thanks. Yeah, I would like to ask a little bit more about exactly how these social distancing measures are going to work in classrooms. Are we going to have hard limits on the number of kids that can be in any classroom at one time? And are more creative options being explored, like having kids uh, do class outside, as we've seen in some of the other jurisdictions that have uh, explored going back to school? Yeah, I know. Thank you for that question. Um, the main uh, way to reduce uh, the number of kids is by um, having a part-time return to instruction. So dividing the class in half, uh, of course, uh, ensures that uh, physical distancing and uh, reducing physical contact between kids as possible. There, there are instructions around desk configurations. There are um, suggestions uh, around uh, how to avoid any you know, congregations uh, in any one part of the building. I suspect uh, schools will utilize the outdoors. Uh, they'll utilize 
large open spaces like libraries, uh, gymnasiums, um, all kinds of things to uh, be able to uh, have the maximum amount of space uh, possible. And uh, that's contemplated in the uh, planning documents that have been circulated in the, in the uh, workplace uh, health and safety protocols. Uh, so that's very much, um, uh, you know, that is very much the responsibility for every school district in submitting their plans to the Ministry of Education for approval, uh, how they're going to uh, uh, manage those protocols that, that uh, set those expectations. Our next question is from Binder Sajjan. I'm hearing from uh, parents who are saying they're not sure if for a month they're willing to send their kids back to school. And I'm just wondering if there was any consideration given to extending the school year perhaps to July. And um, if there isn't a, a big number of parents that are willing to send their kids, do you anticipate uh, teacher layoffs or how that would impact the school system? Yeah, in terms of the extension to July, what we're actually working on with districts that offer summer school is 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 a plan around uh, summer school offerings. Um, the the previous question about supporting, uh, particularly uh, sort of grade eight to twelve students uh, in in getting or redoing courses, um, that need will be there. Uh, so we're going to have uh, you know some ins uh, direction about uh, summer school and, and where those are typically offered in districts. That that I think was the a consideration that uh, that needed more urgent attention and was quite frankly easier to accomplish than uh, than changing the, uh, the 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 school schedule around uh, calendar months. Um, so uh, this, the other part of your question was I'm just uh, had a little bit of a hard time hearing it. Ah, what uh, what we're expecting in, in BC is is uh, and districts have planned for this in their budgeting exercises is we have very strong domestic enrollment growth. We know there's some vulnerability around uh, international students and what we might what might be possible. Uh, districts are budgeting prudently in, in, in those situations. I mean, some of them are looking at a reduction, but not an absolute collapse of international students. And I think that's uh, a realistic way to proceed. So the international education is going to continue to. Uh, be a feature, but it is going to be challenged, and and we're going to work with with districts who have those programs. We'll make sure that uh, where there are teachers that may be a surplus uh, because international students are reduced, that they have opportunities to teach uh, domestic kids, that they that they have ample opportunity uh, for reassignments. We have uh, distance learning programs, those sorts of things. But we'll have we'll have a better idea closer to September. We'll know, for example, how much retirement there has been uh, this year and uh, also how much enrollment growth is coming in. We may see uh, uh, students coming from other parts of Canada uh, into BC as we have seen in, in past years. Uh, all those sorts of things are sort of in, in play, but we have, uh, we have a, a situation where we have enrollment growth domestically in BC that's quite a lot different than from 10 years ago. So teaching positions have been very much in demand. They will continue to be in demand. And we'll work with uh, districts on the, the changes in terms of the contours of how they deliver things like international education programs. Next, we have a question from Jane Said. Oh, hi. Um, I was just wondering what, uh, what you've been hearing from uh, parents so far about uh, whether they are uh, wanting to send their kids back to school or whether uh, parents are concerned about that. Um, and I'm also wondering about how you will deal with um, like the physical space in schools in that some schools um, were dealing with a certain amount of overcrowding um, before the pandemic hit. Right. Yeah, I think you're hearing a number. I've certainly been hearing a number of different things from parents, depending on what their situation is. Um, it has been a struggle for those who uh, have returned to work and, um, and uh, you know, they're not able to uh, oversee and work with the teacher and their child. Uh, that has pulled them in, in many directions. There has been, you know, everything ranging from frustration to a, a lot of patience and understanding and, and uh, some students uh, absolutely thriving uh, as best they can under a brand new delivery model of education that we created out of thin air. Um, so there's, there's been a range uh, of, of responses. I think there has been some um, frustration, uh, understandably, from uh, parents who, have, who were accommodated by the school system because their child has uh, recognized uh, special learning needs, has the, uh, 
uh, expertise and help of, of specialist teachers and support staff that's missing under phase uh, under stage four uh, where we uh, began to uh, offer uh, full-time learning for the children of essential service workers we put a big emphasis on having vulnerable students and those who have uh, special learning needs to get them back in the school system and some districts have done a tremendous job doing that but I, I think uh, this return to uh, part-time in-class instruction that's available to everyone should they choose to uh, to uh, to take this opportunity I think it's going to be good for students. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset in my remarks, kids learn better around their peers. They learn better uh, when they can ask questions and receive direct attention from their teacher and, and support staff in a building. There's no question about that. So um, I think the, the parent opinion around uh, their, their experiences has been, has been pretty measured, uh, uh, very, uh, very patient and uh, very engaged, which is good. But uh, I think, uh, you know, not all parents think alike. They have different situations. And, and I think we've recognized this in moving into stage three by having something for everybody as we complete the school year. Our next question is from Keith Baldry. Hi, good morning. Thanks for this. Not to belabor the point, but um, I've been inundated with emails from teachers and tweets from teachers expressing real concern for their physical well-being if they go into this classroom and we don't know everything about this virus. But it sounds like you're giving the teachers, any concerned teachers, a bit of an out if you just can stay home if you have the sniffles. Is that what's uh, happening here? Yeah, I'll well, let me let me attempt an answer and, and let maybe uh, Dr. Henry uh, also um, uh, you know repeat her message about how this would apply to schools and all workplaces in BC. Um, people who are showing symptoms uh, of illness should not come to work. That includes teachers. That includes people who are working on uh, in grocery stores, frontline healthcare workers, emergency responders. Period. Uh, so um, you know we have uh, worked, as I said, uh, for a number of weeks uh, with uh, education unions on developing a very strong health and safety protocol uh, and uh, and that's being uh, released this morning so I, I have no doubt that there is um, fear and anxiety there there is from every working professional in BC um, and uh, and that's okay I think the more information we give about uh, how we're making workplaces safe um, uh, the better and uh, and I think we've seen from teachers who are back in classrooms in other jurisdictions um, it starts that way and, and comfort levels grow as they uh, see how, um, how to keep a building safe and the, the school environment uh, uh, safe. Yeah. We have time for one more question and it's from Cindy Harnett. Oh, hi. Thanks for taking my question. Just wondering, will you be um, reopening school playgrounds, specifically um, putting basketball hoops back up? And if so, when? Yeah, I'm going to let Don, uh, Dr. Henry have a crack at that one. <laughs> Get him off the hot seat, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so those are some of the things that we're looking at. There's still challenges. So some parts of the school playgrounds absolutely will be open because that's a place where you can have uh, outdoor learning. Um, and that'll be really important. What we are trying to still look at is, you know, how do we ensure that kids aren't um, being given those opportunities to transmit the virus between each other? So physical contact and maintaining physical distances and cleaning protocols are all incredibly important. So it's unlikely that all of the playgrounds will be open uh, for all use, um, but we will certainly be looking at the schools and how uh, the space, the outdoor space in schools and and around childcare um, centers can be used safely um, for kids um, in the coming days, for sure. That's all the time we have for questions. I'll ask the Premier to come up and provide some concluding remarks. Uh, great, thank you very much. And uh, I'll just say, uh, Keith Baldry, the hoop's still up at my place, and with physical distancing, you might be able to get by me. Um, uh, but with that, I want to I want to thank uh, both ministers for the extraordinary work that they've done to to collaborate with all of the stakeholders involved in the K to 12 system and in our emerging uh, child care system, which we have seen over the past number of months is critically important to the development of our economy. For those who thought that child care was a, a nicety, it would be nice if we could. I think that the transformation and how the whole communities looked at the importance of child care has really been uh, transformative for us here in government as well um, 
as those in the sector. So I'm very excited about the future. Uh, I'm very excited about the future for the grads of 2020. This is a time of year. I've been 15 years as an MLA, and for 15 years I've been going to grad ceremonies in my communities in Lankford and in Souk. And I go every year because it gives me hope as I watch young people cross the stage and get their Dogwood certificate. It gives me hope that the next poets and artists and, and contractors and, and tradespeople, doctors, nurses, the whole gamut of society is contained in the class of 2020. And to each of you, I say, uh, go hopefully forward into a future that is yours to make. If you can survive the pandemic of 2020, come out of your high school with your Dogwood certificate, the world is there for you to explore. It will be a small world for the foreseeable future, but it will get bigger. As Dr. Henry says, it's for now, it's not forever. For those who are thinking about the long weekend ahead and thinking about loading up the Winnebago and traveling somewhere, I encourage you as I have and Dr. Henry has for some time, please don't do that. Stay close to home. Every part of British Columbia is spectacular. Wherever you live, you are privileged to be a British Columbian. Stay near your home, explore the neighborhood, and there will be another long weekend and another one after that. Be safe, everyone. Have a lovely uh, Victoria Day weekend, and we'll see you next week.